Good day, everybody, and welcome to Micronutrients 2, All the Things What Isn't B Vitamins. We're going to start by talking about vitamin C. Vitamin C has had a lot of things talked about. It has come up in conversation a lot in the past and now and in the future uh, because it does so many important things. The main things that we're concerned with are its tissue building, so its uh, wound healing function, its antioxidant function, and its immune function. Vitamin C deficiencies develop from, well, age in this population group, poor intake. We are one of the only mammalian species that can't, actually one of the only species at all that can't make vitamin C. Alcoholism and tobacco use can cause vitamin D deficiency, and a distress state can make it more, it's always somewhat, it's always essential, it can make it more conditionally essential based on your wound state. That's why this guy is up here. He ticks three of the five boxes. So vitamin C deficiency presents as swollen or bleeding gums and the loss of teeth. Now it's important to note that um, I have not evident, evident if patient is endontulous, which makes sense, right? Your teeth can't fall out if you don't have any teeth. But also the swollen and bleeding gums don't present if a patient is endontulous. And that is not a small proportion of the elderly population has at least some missing teeth, if not full dentures. So that may not be one to look at, but it's always the classic symptom that's listed. Corkscrew hair. Uh, it's hard to see in pictures. It's probably hard to see here too, but you notice that my hair, my arm is all going fairly smoothly and in line. Corkscrew hairs go just bleh, everywhere. Uh, easy bruising and petty key from uh, blood pressure cuff is a classic sign of vitamin C deficiency. Um, age does appear to be a risk factor for vitamin C deficiency. And, you know, the etiology is poorly understood at this time, as <laughs> is the case every time I say age is a factor. Is it because of poor intake? Is it because of changes in the body due to age? Is it some other factor? We don't know, and the results are conflicting on that. So uh, the immune system, immune system, immune function of vitamin C. Vitamin C does a lot in immune function. It actively accumulates in the skin. It supports the epithelial barrier function versus pathogens. It accumulates in phagocytic cells and it slows necrosis by clearing spent cells and mediating apoptosis. You remember apoptosis is the death of cells, the program death of cells. So it is mediating when the cells die. It's helping to clear out dead cells. Uh, deficiency of vitamin C does seem to impair immune function and it does actively impede wound healing. And then we're going to see that again, just like in the B vitamins, X and every vitamin, really. Every prophylactic extra loading of, of you know, hyper intake of vitamins does not have a prophylactic benefit, but a deficiency definitely is a hindrance to function. Vitamin C is critical to connective tissue formation. It's essential in the production of collagen. And signs of scurvy, which I did mention earlier, but I'm sure you already knew, is vitamin C deficiency. The signs of symptoms are due to loss of collagen production function. So the body cannot produce new tissue and it cannot mend old tissue. It can become conditionally deficient due to increased needs during healing. So again, it's always essential because it's a vitamin, but it can become conditionally deficient. You may have enough stores, suddenly you're injured, you don't have enough anymore. Uh, again, it's a key ing uh, ingredient, that sounds, it's a key factor in collagen synthesis. I am not going to read this slide to you, I'm sure you're glad of that. I think we had plenty of that in the last lecture, but there it goes. There you are. If you'd like to read through collagen synthesis, just know that uh, vitamin C is a key cofactor in collagen synthesis, and it's responsible for the hydroxylation that allows the collagen to assume its tri triple helix structure, which is integral to its function. Uh, it is a redox catalyst for many uh, reactive oxygen species. I just had a Sorry, my train derailed there for a second. It is like the active antioxidant. It is recharged by tocopherol, which is vitamin E. Oxidative damage has been linked to cell death, mitochondrial damage, and maybe aging? 
maybe it is a discussed potential factor in it. And we'll get to aging later. Coming up. Some, um, there is some improvement in mortality with vitamin C supplementation. And this is not a tremendous difference, but it is significant. It does appear to be able to reduce inf the inflammation response of the body. This is again likely due to its really strong antioxidant function. There is a positive correlation of high vitamin C and anti-inflammatory response. So the fact that vitamin C does mediate the uh, anti-inflammatory response is not in debate. That, that is a given. Short-term heavy supplementation appears beneficial to counteract inflammatory stress. So the question to supplement or not to supplement. Again, it's a function as far as mediating inflammatory response and benefiting wound healing and tissue formation is, is not in question. There is a positive correlation between serum vitamin C, which is biologically available vitamin C, and improved morbidity indicators. So remember, a morbidity indicator is how sick is the person? How many morbidity indicators do they have? Is how many different disease processes are they dealing with? So positive correlation between serum vitamin C and improved morbidity. There's less correlation between vitamin C supplementation and serum vitamin C levels, unfortunately. So while it is very obvious that more vitamin C can be good for someone who is ill, it's less obvious that supplementing with vitamin C actually makes it more biologically available to them. There is some evidence that the benefit of vitamin C supplementation increases with age, which may be one of the only really happy things I get to say about nutrition and aging in this thing. So, woo, vitamin C. Okay, vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D, I'll be honest with you here. Vitamin D is the, it's the, definitely one of the two most commonly cited deficiencies in elder care, if not the most. It, that and B, vitamin D and B12 are the two that are, they're in contention. Um, vitamin D shows up in a lot of things, and we'll see this in a little bit. I really thought that vitamin D's time in the sun, if you will, uh, would, uh, I, that, that was an accidental joke. I thought it was going to fall out of favor. I thought vitamin E's time to shine was coming, and that, that hasn't happened yet. Vitamin D is still going strong. So things it does do for sure. It promotes calcium absorption and bone mineralization, so it is very important in elder care. It also does mediate inflammation response. The sources of it are sun exposure, fatty fish, and dairy. Now, you will get people, because we can make vitamin D, um, from sun exposure, you will have people that argue that maybe it doesn't really deserve vitamin status, but for our purposes, we're going to consider it a vitamin. What are the symptoms or, and signs of uh, deficiency of vitamin D? Muscle pain, osteomalacia, and osteoporosis. The, um, the, the supplementation guidelines recommend 1,000 international units per day. It does not recommend serum testing. You will find a lot of serum. You will find in elder care there's a lot of serum testing of vitamin D. It's not really, the American Gerontological Society does not really endorse serum testing. It just kind of suggests that, uh, there, that the elders intake, sorry about that, blah, it doesn't recommend, it doesn't endorse serum testing. It recommends that elders just supplement 1,000 international units per day. So, um, I'll be right back with you. As I was referring to earlier, there's conflicting data. There is some evidence that correlates hypovitaminosis to hypertension and dementia, but it's very, very contentious. And critics argue that the evidence is, and I've got the quote here, and I'm quoting straight from them, is at a high risk of bias with multiple flaws, including analyses of secondary endpoints, small and underpowered studies, inconsistent results, and numerous other issues. Now, I do think that's an interesting quote, partially because of and numerous other issues. I too have crammed late at night to do a paper, and I know when it says I say 
and numerous other issues. I mean, use your imagination. But yes, vitamin D is very, very contentious as a topic and to what it does. Um, if you've seen the, if you've seen the, I blanked again. Seen uh, Dr. Aaron Carroll's video on there that's attached to the unit. You will know his opinion on that as well. Again, it is very, very debated. So, minerals. And I did promise you zinc and calcium, and we'll get to them, but I, I threw in some more because, you know, I'm connected and I care. So there's some extras. So sodium. Uh, sodium has been par positively correlated to blood pressure, and cardiovascular events are still the most common cause of death of the older adult, and, and the adult in general, actually. Um, cardiovascular events. Recent meta-analysis did indicate lower sodium intake and lower potassium to sodium ratios are indicated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And hypertension was the most prevalent factor in uh, greater frailty risk. We'll get to frailty here in a little bit. Frailty is a measure of morphological factors of aging and the risks that they present. But, okay, going on back to all that, in decreased sodium, decreased hypertension risk, excuse me, and a lower potassium sodium ratio. But increased blood pressure does appear to be common in older adults, and there do appear to be negative uh, implications to reducing blood pressure in older adults to a certain point. Now, obviously, if they have a super high blood pressure, that's not great. Um, but, yes, some meta-analyses have shown higher all-cause mortality with a lower blood pressure in older adults. So it may be that we are overcorrecting for that as people age. This is similar to the other things we've discussed. Do lab values need to be different as you age? Do some vitals need to be different, you know, uh, measured differently? Do we have different targets as people age? We don't know. Older men, um, and again, older here means over 65, with normal serum sodium, so that's 126 to 140, uh, they demonstrated faster and more severe cognitive decline. And that is, of course, just, that, that's just showing a tie between them. That's not showing a cause at all. Uh, lower sodium also appeared to be a factor in all-cause mortality. So, again, there's a question as to what degree do we need to control sodium in the older adult? I will tell you in my practice, I don't tend to control it that much uh, unless there's someone with a very, very obvious, either a fluid issue, uh, current active cardiovascular disease, so that they are retaining fluid, or if they just do ludicrous amounts of sodium. And if you're working with someone in long-term care, you, you will know that about them. So potassium. Uh, its functions, its main function, uh, I guess, you know, is part of the sodium potassium pump. And bear in mind that the heart is a muscle, so it is important for mu it's important for muscular contractions. The heart is a muscle. It does help lower and control blood pressure. There is a non-linear correlation between intake and blood pressure. Uh, many medications taken by geriatrics uh, can cause potassium wasting. This is also the reason why it's here specifically for geriatrics. It's not because geriatrics have a stranger reaction to potassium, kind of like they do sodium, which appears to be a bit mixed. Um, it's because a lot of the medications they're on affect potassium levels. And potassium is famously terrible to supplement. As a pill, it's huge, it's hard to swallow, and it can cause nausea. As a liquid, it tastes vile, and it can cause nausea. If you give it uh, intramuscularly or as an IV, it burns. There's just not a good way to supplement potassium. Zinc. That's one of the ones I promised you. Uh, zinc is necessary for wound healing and immune function. It's kind of the mineral that goes along hand in hand in wound function and uh, skipping along merrily with vitamin C. They're buddies. Uh, we will come back to this when we discuss wounds more. Except that's really its primary function within gerontology is its wound healing factor. Zinc deficiency has also been associated with uh, blah has also been associated with agusia and anosmia. So, if somebody is having a problem 
they, they, their lack of taste or smell is poor or gone, zinc might be a beneficial supplement for them. Remember that dyskusia and dysosmia are associated with aging. So we do know that elders are at higher risk for suffering these side effects versus the general population. That's something to keep in mind. There's not a tremendous amount of data on this. There may be more as we know that lack of sm loss of smell and taste are associated with long COVID or at least not even long COVID, but just COVID in general. So there is more research on this coming out now. This has become a, a topic of focus late recently. And I just dated this video as well. So there, calcium. Uh, calcium supplementation is super important. Again, you know, we're associated. Remember that we're talking about gerontology. We have a higher risk of fractures due to lean body mass, but also weakened bones. Uh, calcium supplementation has been shown to lead shown to lead to a modest reduction in fracture risk. Uh, it doesn't appear to be population wide. We cannot draw a direct correlation between them, and we can't draw a straight line from one to the other. It doesn't seem to work that way. Uh, supplementation without vitamin D is not supported, though. They need they. You need them both. You have to have calcium and vitamin D to help with bone function. Uh, the increased, re increased risk of heart disease with supplementation is not supported. That was a concern and it is still a concern for some people that um, calcium supplementation may increase heart disease. That does not appear to be the case. Supplementation is beneficial in a deficiency or osteoporosis. And again, just like everything else, there is no evidence of prophylactic benefit to supplementation. So if you have somebody who has osteoporosis or does have low calcium, then it does, it can benefit, but there's no prophylactic effect. Also keep in mind that specifically with the elder population, we always have to remember that calcium and albumin are linked. Cast your mind back. Remember that there is adjusted calcium level that ties to albumin. And remember that albumin does seem to lower as you age. So it is very possible that this is an artificially low calcium level or that the calcium level just is naturally lower in older adults. It's not something we really know. Are you getting tired of me saying that yet? There's no direct link. We don't know for sure. No direct etiology. Hang on, we are not done. All right, iron. Iron's primary role is hemoglobin. Uh, it's mild anemia is really common in the elderly. Like 10% of the elderly have a little bit of anemia. Deficiency is correlated to fatigue and weakness because of that anemia. And remember, again, we're having that same issue we had before, which is that our older people sometimes weaker and more tired because they have anemia or are they suffering from anemia because of their fatigue which is causing them to be less active eat less well don't know um sorry uh supplementation does appear to improve functional performance this is one of the few times that i can actually say a lot of supplementation seems to make the numbers more numbery you get the numbers to a better place, happier to where 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 they we expect them to be. Whether or not that's actually beneficial isn't something we really know. Um, so that's that's really more would be more my interest is what helps people, and we're not 100% sure that improving the numbers makes things better. But iron is one that does seem to improve functional performance. Prevention and treatment is for iron is to provide iron-rich foods, red meats, dark green veggies. Avoid calcium-containing products for two hours before and after consuming iron because they will compete. The heme biologically available iron has a valence of 2+, and the calcium and iron will compete. And um, 
Man, see, all of this relates from way, way back to beginning chemistry when they discussed valences. It all comes back around, man. All right. So that is all the other little bits of micronutrients that we're going to discuss in geriatrics. So Alterhus, elders are at increased risk of micronutrient deficiency. Artificial supplementation is a viable strategy for deficiency. Not prophylactically, though. Remember that. If there's a deficiency, yes. If there is not a deficiency, no. And there is no evidence that additional supplementation is beneficial. And this is especially important for, uh, let's say C. Uh, people like to give vitamin C to improve immune function and allergies. And there's no evidence that it does that unless you are deficient. Supplementation, additional supplementation does not seem to do anything. All right, guys, that is micronutrients. I will catch you next time when we talk about comorbidities because this train never stops. Have a good one. Talk to you later. Bye.